this is a brilliant idea, is that the optimal position for a human being isn't in chaos or in order, because if it's too much order, then it's totalitarian, and if it's too much chaos, then it's disgust and fear and emotional pain and depression. So, where's the proper place? And the Taoist answer is right on the line, where you have one foot in order so that you're fairly stable, and you have another foot in chaos so that new and interesting and compelling and transforming things are happening to you. And one of the things that you might note is that your nervous system basically tells you when you're there, and the way it tells you is by making you interested in whatever it is that you're engaged in. Because the fact that the thing that you're engaged in grips you, which is really an unconscious process, you can't really control that, it's something that happens to you, is because your nervous system, which is actually adapted to the environment of chaos and order, is telling you that if you're engaged and interested, you are at, in the place where the balance between chaos and order is, pro is perfect. Now, you think about that. It's no use reading a paper that you cannot understand at all, even though, hypothetically, that would be a tremendously informative paper, right? But you can't understand it, because it's all chaos to you. And then there's absolutely no reason reading a paper the tenth time if you've already extracted the information out of it. It's going to be boring. Okay, so what do you want? Well, you want a paper that you can almost understand. So there's, you know, your, your, the frameworks, the cognitive frameworks that you have at hand are sufficient for you to take the next step into the unknown. And the paper will, will inform you of that. And so those are the sorts of things. Books do that. Movies do that. Conversations do that. Even lines of thought do that. If they're exactly at the right level of complexity for you, they're going to engage you. And people know this, man. They know it. So here's an example. Let's say you're trying to, you know, we could say you're trying to teach your child to talk, which of course you don't do. What you do to a child is talk to it. But it's very interesting because there have been studies of how parents talk to children. And what they do is always use language that's slightly more complex than the child can understand. And they do it automatically. It's part of our what, uh, in some sense, our innate knowledge structure about language. So you don't only use words that the child understands. Use words that they understand, plus a few words and phrases and sentence constructions that they don't. And so that's sort of pulling them along. And a Russian psychologist named Vygotsky called that the zone of proximal development. And the zone of proximal development is that place, because it's a place in the environment where information flow into the psyche is maximized. And that has to be, so it has to be quasi-comprehensible. You know, it's something I try to do in my lectures, you know, I try to tell you things that you know and associate them with things that you don't know, so that you're not swamped, hopefully, by an excess of incomprehensible information, but you don't think, oh God, he's saying that again, I already know that, you know, etc., etc. And uh, anything that's dramatic in structure is doing that for you, it's keeping, it's keeping you on the edge of attention. And that place is where your adaptation is maximized, because not only are you firming up the structure that's underneath your feet, you're relying on it, and you know, it's, it's part of the platform on which you stand, but you're absorbing information at a rate that allows you to increase the solidity and area of that solid ground without undermining you so much that it falls apart beneath you. So, it's lovely, it's such a good idea, because Think about what it would mean if it was true. It would mean that if you pay attention to what captures your interest, and you follow that, that means you're going to always be interested in what you're doing. But even better than that, it's going to mean that you're going to maximize your adaptive capacity as much as possible at exactly the same time. Man, that'd be a great deal if it actually happened to be true. Now, it's a bit complicated because what culture wants from you, and what is intrinsically interesting to you, there's going to be a conflict there, right? Because culture wants you to do what a good cultural entity should do, which is to do what you're told to do. But you're not, you know, you're not a robot. And so part of the existential problem that you have in life is trying to figure out some compromise between what you find personally engaging and that develops and supports you, and what the culture will provide uh, resources to you for pursuing. It's hard, there's no simple answer to it. But I would say that if you sacrifice your, your capacity to engage in meaningful activity 
to the security of a given position in a dominance hierarchy, then you turn into something that's like a soulless slave and that's a really bad idea, because there's no way you can do that for any length of time without getting bored and resentful and once you're bored and resentful, the move from that to dangerous is a very, very small step so, it's hard, and it isn't even necessarily the case that you're going to make the balance you know, you're going to be able to manage it but if you don't, you're going to pay a massive price for it so I would say, you know, let, don't let people mess around with what you find compelling any more than is absolutely necessary you know, so because it's very dangerous to do that, it's very dangerous to do that just like it's dangerous not to find a position in a dominance hierarchy at all because then you end up in a chaotic place and my experience has been, you, you might wonder about this, it's like what's the probability that someone can live a healthy life healthy, productive and stable life outside a dominance hierarchy, so without external structure and the answer to that is there might be one person in this class that could do that it's really hard, because what happens to most people is that if they don't have a substantial amount of external structure and routine they just fall apart they don't sleep properly, they don't eat properly you know, they're depressed it's tremendously effortful to continually reinvent yourself day after day and so there's some real, there's some real utility in routine and social identity you know, and Jung would say the part of you that has adapted to re routine and social identity is the persona and sort of the mask you wear in public, it might even be who you think you are and he thought that people who were only persona were dangerous because they were only thoughtless advocates of the system for which they stood but he also believed that per people who had no persona were in an equally terrible situation because they are psychologically chaotic and they don't have a social structure around them to hem them in and continually remind them how to be sane and productive so it's a matter of balance, you know there's, there's horrors on both sides and there's advantages on both sides and the trick is to place yourself in a location where you're deriving maximal advantage from both and you'll be able to tell if you do that because if you are doing that you're going to find your life engaging and meaningful enough so the fact that it's also tragic and potentially composed at least partially of slavery is going to be acceptable and that's what, that's the goal in some sense, it's hard to do that but, you know, it's hard not to do it too so you're screwed either way, so you might as well pick the path that's going to be of maximal utility to you